thanks so much for having me a part of your Friends of History series. I'm happy to be here. So let's get started. And I just want to give you a little background of how I became a potter, um, uh, the reason behind all of my work. First slide. So I was born into a family of uh, pottery makers on our mother's and Separina side of the family. Uh, so all of the, our grandmothers, our aunts, everybody created with clay. And being born into that family of pottery, I have no idea that it was art that we we're creating on a daily basis. Our mom would be making pottery on our kitchen table um, every morning. And she would um, invite all of my siblings and myself to touch the clay. She never forced it on us or anything, but um, she just wanted to say, like, always encourage this, like touch the clay and see if you, um, you would take to it or um, vice versa. So it was kind of cool that I remember being just a kid um, and getting my hands in the clay. Our parents always took us with them um, to gather all the natural materials that we do. So when we say traditional methods and materials, that means that we go and dig all of our own clay all of our, um, the temper that we mix with the clay, um, all of our, our, our paints is uh, made from um, natural, um, uh, different resources that we gather from around the Pueblo. Our black paint is made from wild spinach paint. And I have a, a little video so you guys can understand this whole process that takes a whole year to do um, work with traditional clay. Um, it is a dying art form at Cochiti just because of the amount of time and energy that it takes to um, work with these materials. Um, all of the masters, um, such as our, our mom and our grandmother, are, have passed away. Um, a lot of the family members do know how to um, work with this type of uh, methods and materials, but just the amount of uh, time that you have to dedicate to do it is, is, is what's slowing everything down. A lot of people have moved off the Pueblo or either they have jobs and kids, of course. So that really robs the time of the, that you have to dedicate to use these methods and materials. So what I'm doing is trying to really, the reasons I feel like I'm here on this earth is to make sure that the, this tradition never dies out using methods and traditional methods and materials and also to educate the world about the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, which most people don't know about. If you ask anybody, um, it's not taught in our schools. It's not in our history books. And it's been swept under the carpet because of the genocide and bloodshed that happened to the Pueblo people. So once you see all my work, um, I work in different mediums just along the way out of necessity. A lot of the times where is where I had to pick up different um, types of mediums to help me tell that story. So pottery, the traditional pottery work is the heart and soul of everything that I do. And everything, all the other mediums kind of orbit around it um, and support that. But with all the different mediums that you see me dabbling in, <clears throat> they all work together to tell that story. So I have created, uh, it's really hard to actually to, to be able to get the youth involved, just because like everybody's into social networks and all of the online online presentations of um, all the world's artists. So if you don't have something that's cool or polished or shiny to show them, most likely they won't be interested. So this is why I created a script about the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, America's first revolution happening when it did in 1680. And also another time dimension of 2180 um, happening simultaneously, but coming together and telling the story of what happened to our people. So um, being able to incorporate sci-fi storytelling, um, ha that has really affected me as a kid. Like I, I loved all the different movies and TV shows with all the, these types of superhero characters. So I said, okay, I, to be able to get the next generation's attention, I have to create these incredible um, characters. And once they're learning um, that are like basically capable of standing next to the new Star Wars or Star Trek or uh, people of color types of superheroes like um, Black Panther, right? So once I started developing this whole script, I was able to like really get my nieces and nephews involved because they're so you, they love movies as, as I did as a kid, right? And still love sci-fi movies now. But um, the people in my family that are still creating um, using these traditional methods and material, uh, materials are my two nephews, Kyle and DJ. 
um, Harlan Riano and Lisa Holt, uh, myself and um, my younger niece, which is Harlan and Lisa's daughter, Dominique, and my two sisters, Joyce and Janice. Next slide. So here's just a quick image of like what it takes when we go gather these natural materials in different parts of Pueblo land. And I try to make it as exciting and fun as how we used to do it, like when our parents were still um, here and how it was always a family outing because to gather all of these materials takes a bunch of hands and you need a lot of help. So um, we go as a family and um, to process our clay um, which you'll see in the video next, like in like, I think it's a five minute video, but it um, really takes us the whole year to process all of the materials. So once we go um, get the clay, we harvest the clay, we, before we dig it, we have to feed the earth and ask permission, introduce ourselves, state our purpose and ask for blessings and the guidance of um, how to use this material and work with it. So we spend one whole day gathering the, the clay and it comes out of the earth very damp. So that means it's very dense and it's um, our clay is very pure. It doesn't, um, you don't have to screen it or um, sift it. So, but you do what we do have to dry it. So it takes a whole year to dry um, these chunks of clay that come out of the earth. So once we get the amount of clay that we need, we take it back home, we store it in our barn and by the time a year passes, it has now dried to bone dry. So with the video, you'll see me cracking up the clay when it's bone dry into like quarter inch pieces, rehydrating it in some, a plastic bin. And then the clay is so pure, it is, um, uh, you cannot sculpt with it because it's too sticky. So we have to mix a temper with it, which is palmist um, stone volcanic ash so we gather that um and another part of Cochiti, and that image is on the bottom left hand side with my nephew um digging the the temper out so that is another day's journey for my whole family to go gather that type of material we go get it it comes out very pure as well and it's very dry and once we get it back to the studio i i throw down a piece of canvas on the ground put on my combat boots because of the traction and basically dance on it and have a good time and crush it. And it comes, uh, it becomes really um, pure and soft already. But with this material, I do have to screen it twice. So once it goes through the uh, second screen, it comes out um, as fine as baby powder. So now that we have the clay dry, drying over a year, um, crashed and re, um, crushed up and rehydrated, so now it's time to mix the clay with the uh, temper. So we don't really have an, a, a basic um, recipe, like a, the amount of um, the clay and the temper that we use. It's um, just basically, if I know that I'm gonna make a medium sized pot, I know more or less um, of how much clay that I need to mix. So we tested by slowly adding in the temper and then just running our thumb through it and seeing the texture, what it leaves behind. So if it's really sleek, um, it needs to add more of the temper to it. So slowly you get to that point where it's workable. And while you're adding this temper, you're now you're able to handle the clay and actually um, sculpt it. All of our pieces are built um, with the coil and scrape method. So our, our walls are probably just a little bit over a quarter inch thick and all of the figures that our family makes, um, we make the, the feet first, the shoes, and then when we get to maybe the, the ankle, then it's all coil built. So it's just completely coiled up the leg, joined at the, at the crotch uh, region, and then continuing with the stomach and the chest, and then we build the head. So we let it rest a little bit, and then we add the arms later, um, which are also hollow. Um, once that piece dries, we usually, I usually dry my pieces like maybe uh, two weeks. Um, the sculpting process will probably take maybe another week. And once it's dry, hopefully with no cracks in it, then we have to sand it down. So once it's sanded completely, um, we have to take some water, do a light coating of water so that it removes all the dust from it. And if this piece fits, is able to fit in your, just your normal household, um, oven uh preheat it to 350 sounds like i'm making like muffins or something but you preheat it and you heat it up take it out and it's um our clay is naturally red as you can see but 
we have to coat it with another white clay slip um, to turn the piece completely white. So this is done, uh, the process of like taking a hot piece out of the oven, um, coating it with thin layers of the white clay slip, sticking it back in, heating it back up and repeat the process maybe 10 times. And then slowly you see the piece becoming um, uh, uh, overall white color. So once you get the consistency correct of it and the thickness of it correct, then you let it cool down. And then we have to rag polish it. Um, and it goes from a very matte surface to a glossy surface. And once you get to the glossy surface, you cannot touch it with hands that have um, oils on it. So, um, no matter how many times you wash your hands, like our hands naturally secrete the oils, but you would, when you're painting it, and if you want a piece of the pottery that to be white and you accidentally touch it with your uh, greasy finger, um, we only fire um, our pieces one time and that's the last um, in the process. So after you fire it, and if you accidentally touched it, you'll leave a smudge with your finger. And, you know, that uh, a lot of people complain about the, the cloud marks on it, but it's all natural. And I, um, our family is just thankful that, well, all potters are that, that survived the firing process. So to decorate our, our works, Kochidi uses um, the traditional colors of black, white, and red. So the, the red is a, also a clay slip. Um, and then the wild spinach is the only vegetable part of the whole process. So um, this uh, process takes about two weeks to make a really large batch for our whole family to share. So once the wild spinach starts to bloom, it's purple flowers and I call up my family and we go harvest the, the wild spinach. So this is a tedious pro uh, process you'll see in the video and it um, we have to, what we're doing is like getting just the leaves only like no stems. And we usually, when we do it together as a family, we usually collect about maybe eight 33 gallon size um, plastic bags of the leaves only. And we have like maybe seven really large boiling pots. So we fill the pots with water stick in the, the spinach leaves and start boiling that continuously for at least three days, slowly starts to break down. And maybe on the fourth or fifth day, then you're able to um, scoop, scoop out the leaves with a cotton rag, twist it, strain it. And what we're doing is just um, we're, we're after the juice. So once we get the juice down, it starts to condense more after continuous more another two days of boiling condenses then we slowly start to pour it into one pot and by the time it, it, it's thickened up now and by the time it gets to about half a gallon and now we're able to bring it indoors so being able to boil this continuously like 24 7 my nephews love to help to do that because they're younger and they can stay up and do this but uh, they uh, hand it over to me at that point and I bring it inside and I'm able to put it on the stove top and at this point you have to be very careful of how you're making this paint because if you burn it two weeks of work has just evaporated because like if you burn it it will not adhere to the white clay slip on the pottery pieces so you keep boiling it it gets to the thickness of like you know, like if you're pretending like you're making like the red candy apples that type of consistency and then we slow then we remove it from the from the um, the flame and then we distribute it onto corn husks and this is how we store our paint so the paint we i usually uh, wait an all a whole year to use this paint so like around the six month mark it's still like flexible like taffy and then around the year mark it's um has now hardened up to like say a jolly rancher consistency so once we're going to start painting the piece um we just break little pieces off of the paint crush it up rehydrate it and that's what we use to um, decorate the, the pottery. And it turns, it goes on. Sometimes it, it comes out a little bit green or a brown um, color. And once you add the water, then you start painting it onto the polished piece. And you cannot repeat or um, no matter if you're gonna paint like a large area of black, you cannot um, continuously put layers of the wild spinach on it because it actually does a reverse effect. It'll start streaking it or it'll start peeling it off. So you get one chance, you cannot um, um, erase any of the marks that you just painted on. So all of it is freehand. Um, a lot of the graphics that I do 
um, I'll maybe do a little pinpoint of um, a pencil mark on it. So it's kind of like connecting the dots and, but most of it is freehand. So once it's all completely decorated, then we take, we pit fire and it's above ground pit fire. And we have to make sure that the, the ground, the area is completely dry. So we, I, what we normally do is pre burn the area that we're going to fire at and make sure there's no moisture around it. And we have a grate that sits about eight inches off the ground. And we put a kiln shelf on top of that so that you could, we fire only one piece at a time. So if we're firing our figure to pottery, they stand up. And if we're firing, say pots, the, the pots are upside down. So once you, if you're, whichever piece you're firing, um, say a pot upside down, and then we cover it with, um, chicken wire that is maybe leaves eight inches around the whole piece and the chicken wire is then um, used to hold up um, the fuel that we use to fire it as a cow manure so gathering the cow manure takes another whole year because those have to be completely bow drying so collect the the cow manure bring it home store it in the barn when it's completely dry then you can lay the cow patties around the the chicken wire so it looks like a, a it looks like a, a beehive at that point, and then we use aspen or cedar wood to ignite it. And again, to fire um, the, the, these works, you have to have at least two people doing that um, because, like, we fire outdoors and like we, um, our windshields are just um, tin roofs, or um, you just have to really keep the fire steady going and burning from the bottom upward so that it brings oxygen and the smoke straight up and it keeps it away from touching the pieces that you're firing. So once you about maybe 45 minutes, an hour um, into the firing of just using the fuel as the main, I mean, using the wood as the, as the main fuel, um, slowly the cow manure starts to catch fire. And once you see the cow manure completely engulfed in flames then we stop adding the, the wood to it. And so then the, cow manure will burn like say another hour and a half by itself and it'll burn out itself and it's still all intact being held up by the chicken wire so at that point where all of us are praying that we don't hear any kind of popping or thuds or anything because you can't see the piece it's inside the the amount of um, cow manure so but if you hear a, a popping sound like you know two months of work has gone down the tube <laughs> because the piece has now exploded if it had like the slightest air bubble in one of the walls of the pieces. So, but um, I, I used to get really, really frustrated um, growing up as a kid because a lot of my pieces would uh, break because I didn't know what I was doing. But um, through the encouragement of our mom, she would just like say, okay, like, you know, that's what happens is pick it up and do it again and you'll figure it out. So um, just with that encouragement, always hearing her voice, even, even today, like pieces still blow up on me. But um, just hearing her voices and all of our um, ancestors, people that have passed the potters that were before us, I always feel that I channel um, their their thoughts and their encouragement. And um, that's what helps me get through um, some of the worst times when pieces blow up. But um, when you remove the cow manure, um, take it off and you find one of your pieces that are intact, fired nicely, um, then you get to celebrate, then you're happy. <laughs> so after you get it out of the, after it's cooled down, you can touch it. So now the, the wild spinach has turned from brown to um, ashed over with ashes and you have to rag polish it again. So once you remove the ashes, then you see it reveals it's um, the black paint itself. And then we do a final coating. Uh, a part of the process is um, just like how we use lotion for our skin to bring out the color and the dryness, then we use animal fat or egg white um, to coat the surface of the pottery. So once you do that, it's kind of like adding a patina. It will naturally happen if you're holding a pot with your oils in your hand, that would uh, do the patina to it. And it'll do the same thing, but just to make the process go a little quicker then we use animal fat or, or the egg white. So now it's all polished um, um, and we're just thankful, but here's this short video. Um, you can play the next slide and it'll take you through a whole year's process of what we do.
So that was that's very satisfying to watch it in like five minutes because <laughs> usually, like I said, it takes a year to gather and do all these processes that we have to do to prepare the clay, fire it, get through the whole um, the whole making of traditional pottery. So now you understand why it's kind of a dying art form. It takes so much time to dedicate to continue to do this. But here's some other images of us firing together um, as a family, and it's just easier like if you have more hands to help you fire. Next slide. This is, um, we normally will fire using the, the chicken wire and the cow manure, but you um, also like during the winter time, uh, my nephew made us barrels, uh, metal barrels, so that we could um, do the same thing. And you, you know, the barrel takes over the, the position of the chicken wire and the cow manure. So it kind of works all the time. It takes a little bit more um feel the wood to burn it this way to fire it this way just because of the metal but it also works next slide so this is an example of the storytellers i know you guys um, know about the storyteller figure that originated in coche de pueblo and um, this is the type of um, um subject matter that i learned how to create as a kid so it would always be a grandmother or grandfather or even animals carrying their babies and our language is passed uh, verbally uh, down to the next generation. So this is like about story time and telling our history and recording that in time. Next slide. When I was six years old, our mom would always encourage us and buy our artwork that we're doing. And there's an example of my piece when I was six years old, right in the middle with a red um, jacket on, um, sitting next to Laurencita um, on the right side, holding the two kids, her storyteller, our grandmother and our mom's uh, a drummer and our dad Guadalupe was a drum maker so he would often make the miniature drums to um, give to these storyteller figures so slowly I started to really experiment um, 
not just using the very traditional geometric designs that include earth elements and um, just the natural elements that you would see and like what Coach D is known for. So I started to incorporate my personal design work onto it and really changing the style of what a storyteller would look. So taking a bear and putting the cubs writing on the back. Next slide. So this is an example of one of my very traditional um, pots. And if you look closely, like each design uh, means and has a story behind it. Um, it has the sun and moon design on it. It has the, the wild spinach design on it. Uh, the clouds, the rain, the thunder um, painted into these types of, uh, of uh, very traditional work. Next one. I had uh, seen this image that Ben Whittock had took and he would go around the polo lands and um, document uh, all the different artwork that was being made by the Pueblos. And because it's a dying art form, um, all of these pieces were based on social commentary. So when back in the day, when the invaders first arrived to an area, a lot of the artwork was destroyed because the indigenous people were accused of sorcery and witchcraft for making all these different types of artwork and they're being replaced by um, Catholic statues and all. So it was, um, they were tried to be stamped out once when they first arrived and then the Pueblo revolt happened and then it slowly started to come back to, into the mainstream um, in the late 1800s. So all of these pieces coming from the 1800s were based on like when the railroads were laid um, in our area, it brought more people, brought more tourists, brought more entertainment. So um, along the way, operas started coming into the area, more people were coming into the area, um, circus, circuses would come into the area. So a lot of these really cool images um, of these figurative potteries were all um, like circus sideshow characters that you would see like ringleaders or half human, half animal um, tattooed bodies. So I really took to this type of um, imagery when I was um, probably around 15 or 16. And this, um, our family friend, Robert Gallegos, he was a dealer out of Albuquerque. So he would come and uh, make buying trips to the Pueblos and he knew me since I was six years old and he basically was buying uh, pieces for his gallery um, and so he would I would we would see him like maybe four times a year or something and um, he watched all the different families that were making pottery and he had noticed um, me I mean like he like I said he know he knew me since I was like six years old <laughs> so when he had seen my work when I was around 15, it started to change from making the storytellers and the traditional pots. And it started to develop into characters standing. And I started like using my sense of fashion taste. I don't know, but to like really start to develop my own um, ways of painting um, the designs on these figures. And he asked my parents, like, who's teaching this kid how to do these types of figurative works? And my parents just told them that I was experimenting and, you know, I had their, their hundred percent support for experimenting. And he said, can you please bring him down to my showroom in Albuquerque? And at that point we had never been to Bob Gallegos's um, showroom in Albuquerque, got in the van, went down to Albuquerque. And when my parents and I went into his showroom, it was like a major turning point in my life. Like a pivotal moment is like, we walked in and it turned out that Bob Gallegos had one of the largest collections of historic Coach D figurative pottery, which are a lot of these Ben Wittick photos that he captured. Um, it, like all the pieces that I was experimenting on at 15 years of age looked identical to these pieces, including like with the painting on it. So all of our mouths dropped. We we're all surprised and excited and kind of didn't know what was going on. So my parents pulled me out of out of the showroom and told me like, we didn't teach you any of this type of work. Um, you know, the clay is talking to you and through you. So make sure you remember this day and just know that, you know, this is working out and maybe this is what you're supposed to do. So that was a very special moment in my life that I knew that went back in and continued to be with these pieces and, you know, having this resource through Robert Gallegos, he said, you can come back anytime and study them and look how they're painted and how they're made. And at that point I knew 
that was my life's purpose was to revive these type of um, figures that were um, all based on social commentary and make sure that it never dies out. And I was only 15. So I kind of had my, <laughs> my whole life planned out by then, which is kind of cool, but um, it was very mind blowing to see this and happen. And when we left, I said, okay, this, you know, now I have the resource of Bob's actual figures to, to study, I'm going to go back and really ask him what he knows about them. And um, so like that left the door wide open to me to um, create tradition, these traditional pieces that most people didn't know about. Um, Cause at that time, coach D was known for the storyteller figure, but before then they were all of these um, types of um, characters that were called monos. So no matter what subject you're talking about and the people our people had used them to create a timeline to capture time in clay characters and tell the story of like when all the different people types of people were coming into the area and they made caricatures of them and once the victorian attitudes found out about that these were caricatures of them then they put a stop to it and they told the coach people not to make them anymore so that type of work died out um in the late 1800s so me being like i don't know about ancestral memory or what the hell was going on but i was you know somehow made to um, revive these pieces so um now you're you're understanding a little bit more of like how all the different mediums work together to tell the story of the pub revolt and then also to make sure that this type of work um does not die out so once i had seen this particular image I had wanted to recreate the image and like, and then also knowing the size, like they were up to three feet tall, which was unheard of. And coach it was crazy. And like, um, people are people in the 1800s, they were able to do this without the resources of electricity, running water, all that. So I was like, okay, there has to be possible again. So I started making larger figures, uh, making with the intent to create this image. And I had asked my whole family members, I said, pick one of these images, I mean, one of these characters and study it and then let's go recreate them um, and then recreate the whole image, photograph them together. So that was a little challenge for them. And we ended up recreating this image um, using a photograph because this original background was a painted canvas. And I believe that was supposed to be old Santa Fe Trail. Um, so when I had done some shows out in Prague, um, the Charles Bridge out in the Czech Republic, this re the background reminded me of this um, particular canvas painting so i started snapping pictures with intention that i knew i was going to use that image of that bridge and then create all the figures with my family cut it out uh, photograph it cut it on photoshop and replace the the background with the photograph that i took of the charles bridge so the next slide um this was the result so we're able to um not only recreated, but just bring back the size of what they um, they were made. And we had first showed this collection of 22 pieces at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and as a group. And while it was displayed, I had got a, a phone call from um, Foundation Cartier out in Paris. And they asked me if these pieces were still available. And I uh, I wanted to keep them all together as a group. So they ended up buying the whole group and now they reside at the Cartier Foundation in Paris. And that's really cool to go through that process with my, with my whole family. So that's something we're very proud of. Next slide. So now that we're, we're able to use the, um, and understand the whole type of the social commentary. So I definitely use all um, exactly what our people were doing is to document a timeline so this, this piece here, which is at the Mayak Museum, um, is called Rise Up. And in 2016, when the Dakota Access Pipeline was going on, um, I made this piece and it was a part of my prediction pot series that was all predictions I, I felt was coming through. And like, I feel like all this stuff that I do is not my talent. It's I'm a conduit and it's just lent to me to do um, to use it while I'm here on this earth. So I wanted to really comment and use that power of the social commentary that our people did, who knows how, how long for it. But um, the, the black snake represents the oil pipelines that were being built, the Dakota access pipe, pipelines. 
the politicians um, riding that that wave, collecting money and not knowing that the snakes were coming back to bite them in the back. The middle, um, this is all one pot, by the way, it's just, it's just different angles, of the, um, and it tells a whole story on it. So the middle pot has the politician being devoured and eaten from the inside out of the snake and all the fracking that goes on. And then uh, again, all the, uh, my prediction of the protests that would happen, which would turn into the women's movement. So it, um, I painted the rise fists of protesters and then removing the politician. And I gave that honor to a woman. So it's a woman's hand with fingernails removing that politician. Next slide. This one again is using social commentary. It's called Cyberbully. And this was um, the Cyberbullies sitting on the can tweeting at 5 a.m. So this is again just taking that whole <laughs> social commentary about using it to get my point across. And it's about politicians again using social networks, which is the Twitter logo, um, the, his lower back, um, a cyber bully, um, which, you know, they were accusing of everybody doing that where he was the one that was doing it in, in the first place. Next one, all the different travels that I do go around, you know, I speak for the LGBTQ community and like what they're going through. And right now, like back in the back in the day, they were accepted, like as far as performers and all different types of people like Grace Jones, Madonna, um, Pete Burns from Dead or Alive. All, all these different people were were trans and they were accepted and held in high regards. But now the this community is fighting to even stay alive. So this um, title uh, was called Hate as a Drag. Next one. And then going through my travels uh, growing up, I would go through all different types of, of, of clubs and seeing like the nightlife. So again, commenting on what was going on in the world. Um, a lot of the go-go dancers all clad in leather and latex. So that's a representation of that. Next one. And then slowly I started to really incorporate this, the imagery, the types of design onto my fashion. So um, started working with leather and then incorporating the, um, the res spine design, which is on the handbag. And you can see it like how I started sculpting these different, um, characters, really dressing them in fashion. So I kind of use them as a storyboard or a sketch. So if I wanted to make a corset, I would make it in, in clay first. And then that would be my sketch of how to make the, um, the P the garment next one. So I started playing around again, like trying to really incorporate um, my friends and family uh, as models, doing body painting on them, and then showing the people of how I could really start developing characters using the clay, and then also photography and Photoshop, bringing them all together and making it more sense and um, creating these, getting these sets of characters ready to be a part of a movie strip that I'm working on. Next one. So now you, I was able to work with Smithsonian to design them a 96 piece jewelry collection. So you can see how all these um, signature design elements transfer over to different materials. So now my head is exploding. I'm like really taking advantage of all learning these types of mediums to work with, but it's all coming together to tell the story of Cochiti de Pueblo Pottery and the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. Next one. I was able to work with Donna Karen, and that was our collaboration on the skirt on the left-hand side. So this happened back in 2002, and she had found me during Indian market time, which is, you know, this is amazing to be a part of this whole centennial, centennial year, but she had came to Indian market and um, hired me to apply my um, graphic designs onto her silhouettes and her shapes. And this is an example of what came of it. So it was kind of awesome to release this whole 2003 spring line with her because I was able to give lectures um, when, the line, when the line came out, when we had our first um, fashion show in New York. And I had the attention of all the fashionistas that loved fashion, but knew nothing about Pueblo pottery. So when I gave my lectures, I was able to educate all of them and tell them where the de designs came from, the graphics, the meanings behind them, and hopefully direct them to 
Indian market or any of the polos that are making these potteries. So that was the whole intention. And everything that I do is like way bigger than myself. So I just know I'm a, I'm a, a bead in the necklace. And this is how I try to bring the attention back to our people, the Pueblos, and show them, you know, the artwork that we're, um, that, that we are and is being created here. So being, working with Donna Karen, she, I had, I learned the whole process of going through manufacturing and coming out with my own um, fashion line. So on the right hand side, th those are the results of me using now using like silk and leather and wool, everything combined it into um, household uh, furniture and just taking that aesthetic to the next level. Next one. And then really getting into graphic design and, and Photoshop helps me bring the characters into the picture of the, with the fashion. So this is an example of how they're now working together. Next one. Using um, lithography, which I was had the chance to work at Tamarind down in Albuquerque. And um, to learn this, medium was an awesome experience through um, um gallery hojo down that is in, in hotel chaco in albuquerque so these um, lithographs are available down there in albuquerque if you guys have a chance to stop by they have a wonderful collection of many artists that are at this hotel but you can now see like how all the different mediums that i i try to learn no matter what just because it always comes together and is an extra hand in telling the story next one example of what um, Donna Karen's publication put out. Um, the first supermodel I worked with was Mila Jovovich and I just about passed out when I met her, <laughs> but it was kind of cool to be able to work with um, these um, supermodels and to really understand the whole back um, backstory, the behind the scenes of what goes down to create a whole, a whole line with someone of the magnitude of Donna Karen. Next one. When the magazine started to come out, it was mind blowing to see all the artwork, all the fashion, the garments on, in all the major uh, fashion publications. And then we took it to the next step where we started doing um, home decor. So pillows, duvet covers, um, it was just an amazing experience. And just going through it one by one, like you learn that you'll eventually learn the steps, like anything that you do, you'll get better at it. So anybody that is watching this, if they're younger, and if they're, you know, still deciding on what kind of artwork they want to do, I say try it all because it's going to eventually help you. Next one. So this is an example of hospitality design. And I work with Project Dynamics out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And they had challenged me to design um, all this hospitality design, like which would include like anything that you would see in a in a suite in Vegas, or it doesn't matter where, but just a high-end suite. So they said, we think your, you know, your graphic design will really transfer to hospitality design. So I took on the challenge and they said, okay, do duvet covers, do pillows, do mirrors, desks, um, wallpaper, the carpet, the headboards, whatever you would see in, uh, in a suite. So the next image is a result of that. And that was one of the finest times of I had to do <laughs> to show the possibilities of what this type of um, graphic design could um, develop into. Next one is I had a chance to work at um, at the Corny Museum of Glass in Corny, New York. And I loved, I had no idea of how to work with glass, but I did several visits of how to, um, or to the Corny Museum and to work with their team of glass blowers. And, glass is so alien to me and that's like fit perfectly into the storyline that I was telling. So I developed these designs of um, really seeing like if you were to walk into one of these characters homes in say 2180 the year, you would see some of this artwork. So then I said, okay, cool. I could um, really mesh the ceramics with it as well. So if like these decanters, if they if they use it as a wine decanter, like I had to put stoppers on it. So then I made ceramic pieces of the characters to mesh with the, with the glass pieces. And again, that gives me the, the opportunity to, to continue with the storytelling and the characters. Next one. These were amazing to work with their whole team of glass blowers. And it was up to like six, um, six glass blowers of 
uh, that worked at the Corny Museum. And it was just amazing to be a part of that team. How they work together is almost like telepathy, mind telepathy, because like it's, of course, the glass is 2,300 degrees. So um, the danger of being hurt is always present. But, you know, they kind of just look at each other. So one person would be building one leg, another person would be building another leg all these different design elements that go on the piece and not only just the main body of the piece. So that you have like six people working at all one time and it's just all continuously moving at the same time. Next one. But it's, you just see the, how all of these live in glass can, you know, take on the, uh, the storytelling of what I'm doing. And in, in Kojiti, we have the deer dancers, which are um, antelope, ram and, um, and mule deer. So there's an example of a ram dancer. So I designed this canteen to have the ram horns, but also created a futuristic um, ram out of ceramic. Next one. So now, like, I was like, the main question was like, how to educate the world about what happened to our people, what will capture the next generation's attention. Next slide. And I was like, okay, cool, a movie script. So now that um, I have all these types of mediums that I work with, um all coming together next slide i'm able to really start developing my characters for the script <clears throat> so going back to body painting developing the, all these characters to their fullest potential of their original design and um if we move into the next when we move into the next uh, step of going with a, a, a movie production like i wanted to have keep these characters to their final integrity design so i try to develop them as fully as possible so incorporating the photoshop the design work the body painting everything fashion fabricating wings whatever um it, it's all coming together next one is a sample of once i have the models ready photograph them and then slowly start to it takes on that whole movie poster feeling um, and all the different types of the characters all coming together next one so these are the Venotian soldiers and every um, show that I do at a museum or in a gallery, I will release a new character. So these characters represent um, in the movie script, their pueblos being bombed first for the 1680 Pueblo revolt. And they're in the process of relocating their Pueblo to another part of the land that it has better air quality. So there's the reason why they're wearing gas masks and um, oxygen tanks around their around their necks. But this is inspiring to be able to create them in clay and then mimic them on a model. Or sometimes it works where I design something on a model first and then pick it up in clay afterwards. Next one. And there you there you go again. Is just to mix the the whole design work of the characters the photography and slowly bring it into the to the pottery um, getting their images onto the pottery and it just helps tell the story a lot quicker and also now i'm getting the attention of the younger generation so they're asking more and more about who these characters are what they do and they're slowly learning about what they do and they have no idea they're getting a lesson in history until they know what the public revolt is about they're like oh, okay it's working next one so an example of how I do the face graphics, I will do it on a model, um, take that image and then transfer it onto one of these pots. So again, like I think I told you that I, you can't touch the, the traditional pottery work with where it's supposed to be white on it, the cream color. Um, so what I would do is put it on a, develop the graphics from the model, um, take the picture, develop into a graphic for it, and then put it onto a piece of tracing paper so that I could actually hold it up next to the pot, but not touch the pot. So I would just do little pinholes in the paper, say where the irises are at, the nose holes, the end of the teeth, the ears, the top of the head, and then slowly hand draw in the designs. And um, uh, then that's how I get my graphics onto the pottery pieces. Next one. This is an example of Tao, leader of the blind archers. Um, I wanted my all my characters to be um, women strong just for women empowerment and you know this um one of the main characters everybody knows that i do is a woman with a, a blindfold on 
but I developed her character to, to be a right wing um, warrior next to Pope. The Pope is uh, a person that actually pulled off the Pope revolt in 1680. He was a designer of it. And in my storyline, she's a right hand woman to him. So um, you'll see who this character is and you'll see her constantly popping up in all my graphics. Next one. Sample again, a women empowerment, the real strong women were warriors and combine it with all the fashion now that um, all the costuming that I'm creating, the graphics and it's just helping develop the characters along the way. Next one, had a chance to work with all these different types of materials and this was um, done out at Colorado Springs at Colorado College. And I had a show there at the Fine Arts Center and this was a part of a um, recycled fashion show. So the materials that you see the models wearing were taken from billboards. So I had like, once that show was over, they gave me the billboards and tore them all apart, recycled them and built these, um, built these costumes. And these are the aeronauts. Next one. Had a chance to work at Wright's Ranch out in Northern Arizona. And it was the first time that I, I fired in a um, train kiln, which is wood fired. So the um, Don Wright's, um, he was a master at, at doing the Anagama firing, the wood fires. And it's so different compared to what Kojiti pottery is. Um, Kojiti pottery re relies on like the smooth surface with the fine detailed painted details onto them. But when you fire in a wood, uh, a train kiln or an Atagama, it's usually like they don't paint fine designs on it. Um, they usually tend to rely on texture and carving. So I said, okay, let me try uh, give my hand at this and try to develop the characters of it more. And it's just, it makes it look like they're just ex excavated and very old looking. So I had a good time like learning like how to leave my fingerprints in the in the clay leaving gouges and they're tearing it um really carving them and you know heavy-handed whereas compared to coach it was like very super fine and smooth so that's an example of some of the new high fire works that i'm doing next one um i'm sure all of you guys know elias jade not, af not afraid he's a uh, amazing beater and i wanted to collaborate with him i try to collaborate with as much um artists as i can just because i um, it's fun to just bounce back and forth all of our ideas. Um, these are the Recon Watchmen, and their story is to come back from the, um, the year 2180 to present time and the history to collect all of our songs, our designs, our artwork, shards of pottery, um, take them back to 2180, store them, protect them so that when we get to 2180, all of our designs and songs and ceremonies are still intact and then uh, going using another, another medium um, which is an outdoor sculpture this is still I worked with another person who was a, a, a still um, works with a, a metal fabricator and his name is Daniel Romano out of Colorado Springs and um, this piece is sitting outside of the Inn of Loretto um, Hotel so if you guys have a chance to drop by there and check out these, um, you know, nine foot tall sculptures. They're pretty cool. And the, the bust on there is resembled, um, is, is Pope, the leader of the Pueblo revolt. Next one. I, I, I worked up at the Archie Bray up in Helena, Montana, and I was able to collaborate with more people like Sujin Choi, Ben Shane, and you just see like how all everybody's influences slowly start to come into pieces and it just opens my mind, keeps my creative creativity fresh. And also it's just fun to create with other people. Next one. Meeting June Kaneko, like his pieces are over 15 feet tall, these ceramics. And that was one of my dreams was to create ceramic works this big, but I didn't know how to do it or like the kilns. Obviously you need to have a kiln that is that big, but I had the privilege to, uh, meet June Koneko and his wife, Ree. Um, and he had instructed his, um, his head studio manager, Trevor, to walk me through all of the studios that he has and answer any, any of the questions that I had. So I really asked as many questions of how do you do the base on it without cracking? How do you 
do this? How do you do that? And I, you know, took all that information and applied it to um, works that I wanted to get this big. Next one. So now you can see at the studio, at the Peter Volka studio up at the Archie Bray, I was there for an artist residency and I wanted to go really big. Um, and with all their resources of all the hydraulic lifts, their kilns, all the clay that they have there, um, I really wanted to go big. So um, these are some of the results that came from it. Next one. Um, and I really got heavy into all the different really cool exciting uh, glazes that are available and then really pushing uh, my carving um, technique into all of these pieces. Next one. I was able to uh, invite one of my best friends, Justin Reese, and he's, I think like six, four. So like when we go and create something that is over five feet tall, you have to kind of scrape the insides of the coils and his arms were long enough to reach in there. So <laughs> we, we had a blast creating these large pieces and all of these pieces will be released in maybe the springtime in Santa Fe. So um, stay tuned for that. Next one, uh, example again of us uh, creating these pieces, stepping using step ladders to um, finish the top of the uh, the Recon Watchman uh, bust. Next one, and we worked like seventeen hour days because we're there for only a little over two months. So we knew we had to really move quickly and create these pieces that. You know, I, we've never gone that big before. I've never gone that big. So we wanted to just really push ourselves into learn how to do this, taking the information from June Kaneko and then transferring them and making them into recon watchman characters. Next one. Some of the final pieces, how they came out with the high fire clay on there and me finishing off the ears on that piece. Um, just the memories that it brings back and the whole community of the friends that I met up at the Archie Bay was amazing. Next one, some more samples of collaborations I did with my friend Simon Levin. He's a wood fire and he normally does not work with colors. So it was kind of cool to be able to fire with him in an Anagama kiln and add all these different types of color and textures. So now I'm pushing really um, using all these available um, colors and trying to capture this essence of having a life-size character um if if i'm having an exhibition to be able to walk in and be confronted with these pieces that are the same size as you has a really big impact and also take it into the consideration of the terracotta clay warriors which i'm sure you guys know about and that was my intention was to get to that size using clay next one example of what the pieces uh the size of them uh, my friend sujin Choi and i uh we had i had built the bodies of it and um she was an artist um, in residency up there so she helped me finish the pieces because they had to dry for at least over three months um and she helped me do the the final um the detail of the glazing and to fire them so um she was an excellent collaborator and i can't wait for you guys to see these pieces in person next one we worked on a book and um, it's called Revolution. It's now available. And I work with um, Charles King of King Galleries and all the students that I do work with. I was like, always tell them no more imaginary hurdles. Um, don't put them there because they were never there to begin with. So take the time to just try to do and work with any mediums. Don't uh, put any imaginary hurdles that self doubt in you. Just keep doing it. Um, you're gonna fail fail a lot of times, but the more you fail, you're gonna figure out what you're doing a lot quicker. So I often say that failures are our best lessons, our best teacher teachers. So don't be afraid to fail and you'll move along quicker. Uh, you can see more of the process or, or any of the things that we're working on on the social networks. And I operate mostly out of Instagram. So my handle is just at Virgil Ortiz. Uh, this next short video is of an example of the characters that you will see at the New Mexico History Museum, Museum of Contemporary Native Art, um, the museum, um, IA Museum, and the Mayak Museum, and then also at the new Vladim Contemporary that will be opening um, soon. So here's the last, uh, the last video of a really short snippet. Thank you. 
And we are done. Thank you guys so much. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Virgil. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I'm just impressed with the numbers of different mediums that you've been working in. And, uh, you know, thank you for the female warrior characters and, uh, you know, <laughs> all that you've done. Um, I did have one question. Um, you created an installation for honoring tradition and innovation that will be at the New Mexico History Museum. And, um, in that you have several of your latest Pueblo Revolt characters. Can you describe their superpowers and the roles they play in the 2180 revolt? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. Like it's so exciting because it's the 100th year anniversary of Indian Market. And I love how this exhibition is laid out. Um, yeah. It tells the whole history of what Indian Market, how it was started. Um, it, it's just amazing. Uh, the, the public's going to be amazed of how to see how Indian market started off with using mostly um, clay, um, uh, clay works and back, baskets tree, I think. Mm -hmm. So like, um, then it shows the progression of all the different types of works that were slowly added to it. And then um, at, at my little exhibition part, I mean, the little space and exhibition, I have samples of traditional work and then also of uh, the high fire uh, contemporary work so two of the characters that are in there are, are Tau, leader of the blind archers and also the runners the runners are what pope used to be able to pull off the pueblo revolt so what the basic design um, that he came up with was to send um, to gather all the pueblos together to help um, push out the invaders he sent runners from the northern pueblos to the southern pueblos and they were all given um, knotted cords and love um, leather or yucca and they were instructed to leave one knotted cord at each at each pueblo with their leaders and told them to untie one knot every morning when the last knot was untied that's how they all came together then all the, the pueblos rose up and pushed out the invaders so this is America's first revolution. Nobody talks about it again because of the bloodshed that happened to our people. But this is an interpretation of what you'll see at the installation. And these ones are high fireworks and I incorporated LED lighting into them so that it brings it into the very, very superhero world of and storytelling. And um, I think the kids will have a blast and of course adults as well. But um, just to see how I'm trying to push that whole tradition of pottery making but taking it into a next level of really developing it into not only a film all these characters but utilizing all the resources such as led lights and then you'll see a sample of the recon watchman which is a uh, uh, the piece that is sitting right here behind me in my background so that's one of the largest pieces i've done and um, i don't remember what the size of it but it's pretty darn big so when you see mm -hmm. that you'll be able to see the to the clay works that I've been doing it. So using high fire glazes, you could, you have access to so many different colors and textures. And, you know, that is so beyond what I grew up with, uh, working with Cochiti traditional colors of white, um, red and, and black, but um, using all different types of enamel or glazes, cold finishes, or either just regular glazes, whatever, um, you'll see this. And as well as a video installation that would be in, in, also be playing um and um I, it's going to be an exciting um, exhibition to just walk through all the years of, of of indian market and then where it's going yeah thank you so much for being a part of it and uh speaking of indian market i know that you've had a lengthy career that spans several decades um and you've been involved with the market you know at different times so what is some of your memorable experiences with the market and, you know, how, how has it affected you or shaped your career? I think, it, I mean, just memories, even like when I was six years old, right. I read that the reason why I can remember this was because 
when I was six years old, I that's when the first Star Wars movie came out. Mm-hmm. And, and during ended market time, it was playing at over at DeVargas Center. So my cousins and I would walk from the Indian market to go down to the Vargas center. And, and that was our chance to see movies. So uh, when our parents were selling at the booths, we, the kids would walk down to the, to the mall and, and watch these, you know, these really cool movies and who knew that this would be one of my main influences now um, of how to create storytelling using sci-fi characters, but remembering like how we would, we would get up early in the morning, go to, in in market see all our old friends um you know everybody our, our booth neighbors or just anybody that indian market brings together all of these people you you know you don't see some of these people the whole year but during indian market time is like one of um, a, a chance where everybody gets together reconvenes regroups and like sees everybody again it's just really cool to build all these relationships and friends and watch everybody's career grow but like having this whole opportunity to um have a booth at Indian Market and present there it was just an amazing opportunity uh, because it not only helps you uh, financially but also it helps you network through all the different collectors and all, all again friendships of other artists so that's one of the highlights that I remember and you know it's like one of Santa Fe's biggest attractions that helps the whole city the economy everything there and it's just amazing and like um I know during the pandemic, it, it, it was hard not to go there because like everybody, that's like a, a, a huge portion of indigenous artists income, but um, we all had to learn how to go digital, which we're doing right now on this Zoom session. But you just, I, I mean, I look at it that way rather than it taking a hit and being depressed about it. I, I said, okay, these are the cards that I have. Well, how are we going to work with it? So, um, you know, reaching out to all the old different members that don't um work with digital or have websites or that type of presentation i had made videos to show them like a diy network of how to um photograph your works how to get them onto your websites how to video it how to do a background just very simple basic ideas to help everybody move transfer into a digital world but now that into market is being opened again it's amazing it's going to be amazing to see it in person and i can't wait for it Great. I know I'm excited and I'm really excited to include your work in this exhibition. And I appreciate your, you know, providing us with this talk today. So thank you so much, Virgil. I appreciate the opportunity. Everybody have fun, stay safe, peace, light, strength, and health to everybody. Mm -hmm.